In the wake of his father Yasujiai's demise, Timujin, the future Genghis Khan, and his family faced the harsh realities of Mongolian tribal life. The untimely death of Yasujiai left his widow Hoiland and her children vulnerable to mistreatment. A pivotal incident occurred during a spring feast where Hoiland was subjected to deliberate snubs by women from the Taikid clan, forcing her to seek refuge near Mount Burkhan Kaldun. Raised in the rugged wilderness, far from civilization's comforts, Timujin and his brothers navigated a landscape rife with internal strife. Tensions simmered between Hoiland's sons and their half-siblings, fueled by envy and rivalry. A moment of reckoning arrived when Timujin, fishing by the river, captured a golden fish, only to have it seized by Yasujiai's other sons, Better and Belgudia. Determined to assert their authority, Timujin and his brother Kazar hatched a plan for retribution. Ambushing Better while he tended to the horses, Timujin struck from behind as Kazar confronted him head-on. Tragically, the confrontation culminated in Better's demise, a grim testament to the depths of betrayal and violence simmering beneath the surface of the Mongolian steppe. Thus, amidst bloodshed and betrayal, the seeds of Timujin's legendary destiny were sown. The Taikid, under the leadership of their formidable chieftain Targatai Kiraltuk, posed a significant threat to Timujin and his family. Fearing for their safety, Belgudia was sent into the forest, while Timujin sought refuge in the mountains to evade the relentless pursuit of their enemies. Amidst the treacherous landscape, Timujin and his family endured a desperate struggle for survival. Starvation gnawed at their strength, forcing Timujin to descend from the mountains after ten grueling days. Captured by the Taikid, Timujin found himself shackled and at the mercy of Targatai Kiraltuk's control. Yet, during a feast along the Onan River, Timujin seized a fleeting opportunity for freedom. Exploiting a moment of lax vigilance, he overpowered his guard with his wooden restraints, orchestrating a daring escape into the unforgiving wilderness. Following their escape, Timujin led his family to find solace amidst the rugged terrain of Mount Burkhan Kaldun, known today as the Kentiai Mountains. Their plight was dire with only a single horse remaining, save through Belgudii's hunting prowess amidst their desperate circumstances. When Belgudii returned triumphant from the hunt, Timujin wasted no time in mobilizing a pursuit of the horse thieves. After days of relentless pursuit, Timujin encountered Boorshu, a skilled youth with a noble lineage and later to become one of Genghis Khan's esteemed generals. Boorshu's information proved crucial as they tracked down the thieves and their pilfered steeds. Together, they embarked on a daring mission to reclaim the stolen horses, facing off against the thieves in a display of courage and determination. Timujin's mastery of the bow and arrow proved decisive, thwarting the thieves' attempts to reclaim their plunder. With the horses recovered, Timujin expressed his gratitude to Boorshu, offering to share the spoils as a token of their newfound camaraderie. Yet, Boorshu, embodying the spirit of loyalty and friendship, declined the offer, solidifying their bond as allies bound by shared trials and triumphs amidst the unforgiving expanse of the Mongolian wilderness. As Timujin matured, he recalled the arranged marriage his father arranged when he was just nine years old. Accompanied by his loyal companion Belgudii, Timujin embarked on a journey to the camp of De Saiken. Upon meeting Timujin, De Saiken was impressed by his stature and agreed to honor the marriage arrangement, granting Timujin the hand of his daughter, Borte. In a gesture of gratitude, De Saiken bestowed a sable coat upon Timujin's mother, Hoelan. Meanwhile, Timujin's father, Yusujii, had once aided Togrul, the leader of the Karaites, in reclaiming his position as Khan. Recognizing Togrul's newfound power, Timujin, along with Khazar and Belgudii, journeyed to pay homage to him in the dark forests near the Tula River. Presenting Togrul with the sable coat gifted by Borte, Timujin earned the respect of the Karaites' leader. Impressed by Timujin's strength and leadership potential, Togrul pledged his allegiance and rallied scattered members of Timujin's families to his cause. As dawn broke, 
Hoeland slumber was shattered by the urgent warning of approaching riders, heralding the vengeance-seeking Merkits from the southern shores of Lake Baikal. Driven by the memory of Yasuji Ai's abduction of their leader's wife, the Merkits launched a relentless raid to seize Borte from Timujin's tribe. Forced into a desperate retreat, Timujin led his outnumbered forces to the safety of the Kintiai Mountains, concealing Borte within a cart. Despite their efforts, the Merkits uncovered Borte and handed her over to Chilon Beck, casting a shadow of uncertainty over the paternity of her future children. Determined to reclaim his honor, Timujin sought aid from Togrul's carries. With Togrul's support and the enlistment of Jamuka, chief of the Kamek tribe, an alliance was forged to confront the Merkits. Crossing the Kilun River, Timujin and Jamuka launched a daring assault on the Merkits' stronghold, the Taktoa Beki tribe. In a swift and decisive strike, they plundered the Merkits' riches and rescued Borte from captivity. Upon their return, Borte gave birth to their eldest son, Joki. However, the circumstances surrounding Joki's birth during the tumultuous Merkit raid fueled speculation about his parentage, reflected in his name, Joki, meaning guest in Mongolian. Following the rescue of Borte, the alliance between Timujin and Jamuka dissolved. However, their bond as sworn brothers, or Anda, remained unbroken as they set up camp together near the Tula River. One fateful summer day, as their camps prepared to relocate together, Jamuka selected a spot for rest, prompting Borte to voice her concerns. Sensing the potential for conflict, she urged Timujin to depart quietly to preserve their friendship. Moved by Borte's wisdom, Timujin heeded her counsel and led his followers onward into the night. Among them were esteemed figures such as Timujin's uncle Deridai Achijin, his cousin Hachiwar, Sasha Beki of the Jerkin, and the son of Hachala Khan. This pivotal event marked Timujin's ascent to leadership, a momentous decision fueled by the recognition of his capabilities. Despite sharing lineage, Timujin's status didn't match that of Alton and his companions. After deliberation, they unanimously anointed Timujin as the new leader of the Mongols. Timujin ascended to the title of Khan, hoping for Togrul, the leader of the Karaites, to support him. Togrul, pleased that the Mongols had chosen another leader, acknowledged Timujin as Khan. Yet, Timujin's departure from Jamuka's camp was bound to stir discontent. His messengers relayed the news to Jamuka, who, despite any misgivings, remained tolerant. He merely questioned why Alton and Hachiwar had not nominated Timujin as Khan when they camped together, offering blessings of loyalty to Alton and Hachiwar. Amidst the fragile peace, tensions flared between Jamuka's brother Bector and Timujin's follower Joki, sparking a tragic confrontation. Bector's actions led to his demise at Joki's hands, igniting Jamuka's wrath against Timujin. Donning his armor, Timujin faced Jamuka in a fierce battle, seemingly retreating towards the Onan River. However, Jamuka refrained from pursuit, instead unleashing brutal reprisals. Seventy pots boiled with the blood of Timujin's chieftains, and his close friend Nerida Kashag met a grim fate at the executioner's blade. Despite the setbacks, Timujin's resilience garnered him political capital. His defeat in battle didn't deter his supporters. In the aftermath, he found allies and chieftains like Jerchadai of the URUUD tribe and Hoelan's brother Hojo Oldar, who defected to his side, fearing Jamuka's ruthlessness. Timujin's influence continued to grow, attracting talent from far and wide. He welcomed refugees with open arms, often hosting feasts along the Onan River's forested banks. Meanwhile, Togrul, his former suzerain and lord of the Karaites, faced challenges of his own. Despite being a Christian of the Nestorian sect, Togrul's rule was marked by ruthlessness, including the execution of his own brothers. One sibling, Urkara, sought refuge among the Merkit, eventually orchestrating Togrul's overthrow. Forced into exile, Togrul sought sanctuary among the Khitan before wandering towards the territories of the Naaman tribe and western Sia. Surviving on meager sustenance, he eventually found himself seeking shelter with Timujin, riding a blind horse. 
Timujin, showing compassion to the fallen ruler, welcomed Togrul at the Carolyn River. While history remains silent on Togrul's eventual return to power as Count of the Karates, it's likely that Timujin played a pivotal role in his restoration. In the vast expanse of the Mongolian steppe, Timujin forged his reign amidst the remnants of a shattered empire. Once, the Jin dynasty and the Tadar people had ravaged the land, leaving the former Mongol Empire in ruins. Yet, amidst the chaos, alliances shifted and opportunities emerged. The Jin dynasty, vexed by the Tatars' audacious plundering under their rule, sought a new force to counter their unruly neighbors. They turned their gaze to Timujin, recognizing his burgeoning power and potential as a formidable ally. With the cunning of diplomacy, they reached out to him through their chancellor, Wan Yin Xiang. Timujin, fueled by ancestral vengeance and ambition, seized the chance to strike against the Tatars. Enlisting the aid of his suzerain, Togrul of the Karaites, he forged a formidable alliance. Togrul, nursing his own grievances against the Tatars, readily joined forces with Timujin. As the sun rose on the Mongolian steppe, Timujin and Togrul marshaled their forces against the Tatars. Three days of relentless siege followed, with wooden fortifications crumbling beneath their onslaught. In the end, Mingus Eliritu, the Tatar chieftain, fell to their combined might. In the aftermath of victory, the Jin dynasty honored Togrul with the title of king, elevating him to a position of unprecedented prestige as Wan Khan. Though Timujin's role was pivotal in the triumph, the Jin dynasty bestowed upon him a lesser title, reflecting his subordinate status to Togrul. When Timujin launched his assault on the Tatars, the Jerkin saw an opportunity to strike and ambushed his camp, resulting in casualties. In retaliation, Timujin swiftly led his troops to victory, defeating the Jerkin and slaying their leader despite their noble lineage. In 1197, Following the triumph over the Jerkin, Timujin turned his sights to the Merkit chief, Taktoa Beki. The clash unfolded at Montiga, where the Merkits suffered a decisive defeat, with the spoils of the battle awarded to Togrul. Taktoa Beki, fleeing to Bakhusen on the eastern shores of Lake Baikal, faced relentless pursuit by Togrul, resulting in the demise of his son, Togas Beki. In January 1199, Timujin and Togrul forged an alliance and launched their inaugural assault against the Naaman's tribe. With the demise of the Naaman's king, Yenanchi Bilge, his realm fell into the hands of his two sons, Tyang and Byrek, who divided the territory between them. Tyang governed the plains tribes of the Kabdo region, while Byrek controlled the mountainous regions near the Altai Mountains. Their joint campaign commenced with an attack on Byrek, led by Togrul and Timujin. Despite their initial success, Byrek managed to evade capture by fleeing to the Altai Mountains. Choosing not to pursue him further, Togrul and Timujin retreated to their respective territories. However, the Naamans remained a formidable foe. As they journeyed homeward, they faced an ambush led by a leader named Kakshigul Sabrahi. Though prepared to engage in nocturnal combat, Togrul silently departed during the night to safeguard himself. As Togrul established his camp at Dadal Talgoy, his son Singam and brother Jaka Gambu positioned themselves near the forests of Karakoram. In a sudden onslaught, Naaman's leader Kok Seuut Salbakiai launched an attack, devastating Togrul's forces and plundering their possessions. Facing dire circumstances, Togrul sought aid from Timujin, demonstrating magnanimity. Timujin promptly dispatched four esteemed generals, Boorshu, Mukali, Barokal, and Chilon, to bolster Togrul's defense. Despite initial success in securing their spoils, the Naamans launched a relentless assault, resulting in the loss of valiant Karate's warriors and a narrow escape for Togrul's son. Timely reinforcements from Timujin turned the tide, enabling the recovery of captives and livestock. Subsequently, Timujin and Togrul redirected their efforts towards the Taikid people, erstwhile allies of Timujin. Joined by the Merkits, the Taikid prepared for battle against Timujin and Togrul. Despite their unity, they faced defeat at the hands of the resolute allied forces. 
After a string of triumphs, Timujin faced a formidable challenge from his blood brother and comic chief, Jamuka, in 1201. A coalition of tribes, including the Jadaran, Saljeduk, Yukalasi, Anjuret, Merkit, Taikid, and several Tadar factions rallied under Jamuka's leadership, bestowing upon him the title of Gherkin. With a unified front, they set their sights on attacking Timujin's tribe. Recognizing the imminent danger, Timujin swiftly sought aid from Togrul. At the Carolin River, the combined forces of Timujin and Togrul clashed with Jamuka's coalition. Amidst the confrontation, Merkit shamans Byrick and Kujuj attempted sorcery to disrupt Timujin's army, but the elements turned against Jamuka's forces, plunging them into disarray. Interpreting the natural phenomenon as divine intervention, Jamuka's alliance dissolved, scattering to their respective territories. According to the history of the Yuan dynasty, when Jamuka arrived, he found the alliance had already been defeated. Left with no alternative, Jamuka submitted to Togrul's son, Sengum, becoming one of his subordinates. After the decisive victory over Jamuka's coalition, Timujin turned his attention towards the Taikid leader, Arakajitur, who retreated to the Uriankai territory, gathering all available forces to confront Timujin in a climactic showdown. Historical accounts, including the secret history of the Mongols, suggest that the battleground was likely near the Onan River. The battle raged from dawn till dusk, with fierce combat testing the resolve of both sides. Timujin himself narrowly escaped death when an arrow struck his neck amidst the chaos of battle. As dawn broke, the Taikid, realizing the dire situation, abandoned non-clan members and fled the battlefield. Among the fleeing was a group from the Baisa tribe, including a young warrior named Jerkoadai. During the battle, Jerkoadai had inflicted a wound on Timujin's prized horse, an act of audacity that impressed Timujin. In a display of admiration for Jerkoadai's honesty, Timujin bestowed upon him a new name, Jeeb, signifying his forthrightness. Little did they know, this moment would mark the beginning of a legendary partnership. Jeeb, now under Timujin's command, would emerge as a prominent figure in the annals of history, playing a pivotal role in the conquests of Turkestan, Persia, and Russia. In the year 1202, Timujin launched his final assault on the Tatar people, intending to solidify his dominance over the region. Before the battle, Timujin instituted new regulations for distributing spoils, emphasizing equitable distribution among all warriors. However, Timujin's uncle, Deridai Achijin, his brother, Kutchel, and Prince Alton chose to hoard their plunder, defying Timujin's directives and tarnishing their reputations in the eyes of their comrades. In response to their defiance, Timujin dispatched Jeeb to reclaim the stolen goods, asserting his authority and upholding the principles of fairness and unity within his ranks. Feeling aggrieved by what they perceived as unjust treatment, Deridai Achijin, Kutchel, and Prince Alton swiftly defected to Togrul's camp, seeking refuge and support in their bid for power. Following the triumph over the Tadar people, Timujin established his headquarters in the upper reaches of the Kurlan River, while Togrul's seat of power resided upstream along the Tul River. Tensions simmered as Timujin's expanding influence encroached upon the territory of the Karaites, setting the stage for a consequential clash. Togrul, the final leader of the Karaites, adhered to Nestorian Christianity, a faith entrenched among his people since the 12th century. Speculations arose, suggesting Togrul's potential identity as the John, the Sacral King, as perceived by Europeans. In a pivotal turn of events, Timujin extended his support to Togrul in the campaign against the Naaman's people, facilitating Togrul's reclaiming of control over the Karaites. Amidst the victory, Togrul contemplated passing the mantle to Timujin, even considering the adoption of Timujin as his own son. Allegedly, Grand feasts were held in the depths of the Black Forest, where Timujin was formally declared Togrul's heir. In a bid to cement their alliance, Timujin proposed matrimonial unions between their offspring, but Singham was against it. Expressing his concerns to his father, Singham warned of Timujin's ambitious nature, 
fearing that upon Togrul's passing, Timujin would seize power for himself. Singam sought Togrul's backing to curb Timujin's influence. Despite Singam's pleas, Togrul remained indecisive, even as Jamukha and Singam initiated their machinations. Orchestrating with Singam, Jamukha devised a plan to set fire to Timujin's pastures, aiming to provoke retaliation. Of course, a mere fire wasn't enough to incite war. Singam sought to ensnare Timujin with deceit, as meticulously detailed in the secret history of the Mongols. In spring, Singam deceitfully agreed to Timujin's proposed marriage and invited him for drinks. Timujin, unaware, planned to attend with only ten men, lodging at Munlik Esid's house along the way, sensing treachery. Acknowledging Singam's prior refusal and the arson of Timujin's pastures, Timujin heeded Munlik Esid's warning and sent two subordinates in his stead. Despite Singam's failed stratagem, he later convinced his father to organize an ambush against Timujin, which was thwarted when a commander leaked the plan. After rallying his soldiers, Timujin ambushed the Karaites between the upper reaches of the Kurlan River and the Karakoram River. Despite achieving victory, Timujin suffered significant losses and retreated to Duranamorgos, the easternmost point of Mongolia. Though the Karaites were defeated, their army remained formidable, posing a constant threat to Timujin's forces. Fearing further attacks, Timujin continued his withdrawal along the river, eventually settling in Babel Sagan, near the Argun River, as historical accounts suggest. Amidst Togrul's alliance, discontent brewed among Mongol nobles, including Timujin's uncle Deridai Achijin, cousin Alton, Jerkin, and Jamukha, who plotted against him. Aware of the conspiracy, Togrul preemptively crushed the rebellion, capturing Khazar's wife and son, though Khazar himself eluded capture. Seeking refuge with Timujin, Khazar devised a ruse to deceive Togrul. He dispatched messengers, feigning ignorance of Timujin's whereabouts and proposing a meeting at Argon Gol on the Kurlan River. Timujin's forces lay in wait at Argon Gol, where Togrul, unsuspecting, warmly welcomed Khazar. The ensuing battle caught Togrul off guard, as Timujin exploited precise knowledge of Togrul's defenses. After three intense days and nights of fighting, Timujin emerged victorious, forcing Togrul and Singam to flee westward. Tragically, Togrul's flight ended at the banks of the Danube River, where a Naaman's officer, mistaking him for an enemy, fatally struck him down, despite Togrul's futile attempts to reveal his identity. Following his triumph over the Karaites, Timujin's influence extended across the vast steppes of Mongolia, leaving only the western territories under Naaman's control. The Naaman's people, descendants of Turkic origin, adopted the cultural practices of the Uyghur Turks. Upon the demise of their esteemed leader, Yelu Naidu, his sons Tyang and Bayrak divided the Naaman's tribe, fostering a bitter rivalry between them. Timujin astutely exploited this internal discord, forging an alliance with Togrul to subdue Bayrak. Tyang, witnessing his brother's defeat, remained passive, realizing belatedly the encroachment of Timujin's dominion. In a bid for vengeance, Tyang sought aid from the Wangu Turks, proposing a joint assault. However, his overtures were met with rejection, and the Wangu Turks, rather than aiding Tyang, disclosed the plan to Timujin. In the spring of 1204, Timujin received urgent tidings, prompting a council of his generals. While most advocated for patience until autumn, Timujin's uncle, Deridai Achijin, urged immediate action, echoed by Timujin's brother, Belgudiai. Undeterred by the risks, Timujin swiftly mobilized his forces, marching through Abjikaktajal to Wernernet near the Huluan River in eastern Mongolia. There, they faced a formidable coalition comprising the Naamans, Karaites, Hudugu Beltegu, Jamukha's Kamik tribe, and others, all united against Timujin. Tyang, the Naaman's leader, proposed a strategy to lure Timujin into pursuing them over the Altai Mountains, where their rested mounts would outmatch Timujin's fatigued forces. However, his plan was scorned by Prince Gutzluk and Naaman's General Korasubek. Forced to abandon his scheme, 
Tyang confronted Timujin head-on. Sensing the impending clash, Timujin took personal command of the front line, leaving the center to Khazar and the reserve forces under Timuj Wasajin. As the Mongol vanguard surged forward, the Naaman's morale waned, prompting a retreat to the cliffs of Nahuch Mountain. Timujin's forces besieged the mountain, trapping many Naamans who perished attempting to escape in the darkness of night. In the aftermath, Timujin emerged victorious, consolidating his control over the Naaman's power structure, save for those loyal to Gutzaluk and Byrak. Once blood brothers, Jamukha and Timujin's paths diverged into rivalry amidst political turbulence. Despite their ideological conflicts, their bond remained unbreakable, standing as beacons of loyalty and stature. Though Jamukha orchestrated alliances against Timujin, he often acted as a double agent, betraying secrets to his former comrade. As Timujin consolidated power, Jamukha found himself isolated, relying on only a handful of loyalists. However, his fate took a drastic turn when betrayed by his companions on Tangnu Mountain, handed over to Timujin as he roasted antelope. Timujin, torn between disdain for betrayal and loyalty to their past, offered Jamukha forgiveness, which the latter, displaying rare nobility, refused. With their reunion marked by defiance, Jamukha's fate was sealed. Timujin granted him a bloodless death, honoring Mongol tradition. Unified and victorious, Timujin sought to establish his authority. In the spring of 1206, he convened the Kurultai on the Onan River, unfurling the Nine White Tails banner, marking the dawn of a new era. Regarding the title of Genghis Khan, some accounts attribute its origin to 1203, following Timujin's victory over the Karaites, while others assert that Timujin was hailed as Genghis Khan upon assuming leadership of the tribes. History of the Yuan dynasty suggests that the title was formally bestowed upon him during the Kurultai of 1206, with Shaman Kokochu declaring him Genghis Khan by divine decree.